So about six years ago, I uh, took some time and set a little bit of money aside uh, to get one of those Ancestry.com, uh, one of their, their subscriptions that you could go in and, and look at all the old documents. And I just wanted to uh, map out uh, my family's history, our heritage, our ancestry, where we have come from. And then a few years later, just a couple of years ago, uh, I kind of concluded all of that by getting one of those uh, 23 and Me little like the one of the, it's like it's actually kind of gross, uh, but you get the little tube and then you have to like spit in it and you send them your spit and then they give it to all the law enforcement personnel so that you know you can't commit any more crimes. Uh, but uh, then they also take it and they tell you all sorts of things, some things that I think are kind of interesting, uh, like where your family has come from, where your mix of DNA is similar to those around the world, and also some information that I think is maybe a little bit of, of hokum, where they say you're more likely to lose your hair and I. That, that might have been true, but you know, more, you're more likely to like have darker eyes or these kinds of things. I don't know all about all that. What's interesting though, is when you get that ancestry data and it tells you, hey, you share DNA with people from, historically from these areas of the world. And it did confirm in fact that I'm just, just a white guy. I'm just, that's just how it is. Uh, but I found, it kind of confirmed what I had already done the work on, that both sides of my family, there's a little bit of German, a little bit of like UK and Ireland area. Uh, but, and, and that's a lot less important to me. What I think is interesting is the little tidbits and the little stories that you learn along the way. So both sides of my family, both my mother and father's side, uh, there is some Swiss German ancestry where uh, families immigrated from German speaking Switzerland and took roots here in the United States, uh, some earlier, some a little bit later, some fairly recently. And uh, on both sides, uh, they came over and they wanted to just, uh, they wanted to Americanize as quick as they could. So there's one family that had a bunch of kids and uh, they immigrated uh, north of Philadelphia to the north of Philadelphia. And if you go to the cemetery north of Philadelphia, I can't remember what cemetery it is, but you'll find the plot for my family. And it's the Keichlein family from uh, Switzerland, German speakers. But some of the kids changed their last name from Keichlein to Keithline to be sound more American, to sound more British. And so you have mixed in together some kike lines and some Keith lines. Something similar happened to the other side of my family. They were, their name was Hablutzel. They came over from uh, German-speaking Switzerland and immigrated quickly to uh, Missouri. And as you might imagine, maybe the Missourians weren't super excited about having some German come in. So uh, they quickly changed their name as well. And they thought to themselves, you know what? What's the most American kind of name we could take on? And so I kid you not, they changed their name to Yankee. They're like, we're just good Americans. So they went from Hablutzel to Yankee. So my great grandmother on my dad's side, uh, her maiden name was Yankee before she got married. And these kinds of things are fun. It's good to uh, enjoy these stories. And I love hearing about those kinds of things from other people and from my own family. Uh, but many times where we come from, uh, the families that we come from, the places that we come from, uh, can dominate more than just fun tidbits and fun stories in our life. We've been talking about idols for several weeks, and today we're going to explore how we can sometimes build our nationality, our heritage as an idol in our life. We can make a group that we want to be a part of, and we think that everybody out of that group is not as good, is not as smart, and is not, is not as deserving as maybe we are. And that's actually how, what we hear in this passage from Luke chapter four. So I invite you at this time to grab your seat back Bibles and you're gonna open up to the New Testament. So kind of the back uh, two thirds of the back quarter, and you're gonna find page 47 in the New Testament. We're gonna be in Luke chapter four beginning in verse 16, Luke chapter four, verse 16. This is Jesus preaching uh, probably the first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth, if not the first one, the first one that we have recorded. It was fairly early. This is what we read beginning in verse 16. When he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim to a release to the captives and a recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and they were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? They, he said to them, doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown, the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in uh, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is there were many widows in Israel and in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow as Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them were cleansed except for Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they may hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This passage presents us uh, with this story about Jesus going, he's from the town of Nazareth. He grew up there. Uh, so everyone knows him at that point in the ancient Near East and in the ancient world, there were no big cities. Everything was fairly small. Even the big cities would be uh, by our estimation, fairly small, relatively small. And, uh, so he knows everybody there and he goes to synagogue as you do on the Sabbath and synagogue. Actually our worship services today are quite a bit like what synagogue services would have been. Then uh, everyone would gather together. They would uh, recite Psalms. They would sing songs and then they would uh, hear from the scriptures, what we call the old Testament. They would have just called it the, the scriptures um, and, or maybe the prophets, they would sometimes call it that. And then somebody would teach and it wasn't always the leader of the synagogue. It was kind of a rotating group of uh, adult men who were allowed to teach. And so this is exactly what happens here. Jesus has been out doing ministry around Galilee, around the wider region. And he comes back to his hometown and goes to worship at the synagogue. And the synagogue leader invites him to speak. And so uh, Jesus takes the scroll, he has it open, and he has them read uh, this passage from the prophet Isaiah. Maybe there we go. And this is what the passage says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. The prophet Isaiah is a pretty big uh, selection of prophecies that we have in the Old Testament. And for Isaiah, uh, much of what his prophecy surrounded was some future kingdom, some future that the Lord was preparing, where up on the mountain that Jerusalem sits, all the nations, people from every nation and every tongue would be brought to the mountain and... The sick would be healed. The poor would no longer be poor. Those who were slaves would be set free. Much of Israel's or much of Isaiah's prophecies surround this idea of some future kingdom of some future king that is going to bring all people of the world into God's reign and that everything will be made right, that everything would be set level, that the, there would be healing and goodness and beauty everywhere. And that's what this passage is referenced to. It's the prophet saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do this work, to proclaim. And Jesus reads this passage and uh, he is now kind of contextualizing it to be about himself. And he ends with this phrase here that all of these things are going to happen and specifically to proclaim the year 
of the Lord's favor. This idea of the year of the Lord's favor is a reference to what's called the Jubilee in the Old Testament, in the law, where God actually designed in the law that the Israelites were supposed to every 70 years uh, reset everything. Everybody who had bought land, it would go back to the original family that owned it. Anybody who had slaves, the slaves would be set free. Anybody who had debt would get canceled. That's what we call the year of the Lord's favor in the Old Testament is this year of Jubilee. And we actually don't have any evidence that uh, any time in scripture that the Israelites practiced that year of Jubilee because it's kind of a big deal, right? That's kind of a radical thing to do. But here Jesus has said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus says something that is from their perspective is truly insane. He rolled back the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. that's what they would have done. Uh, The congregation would have been standing and then the teacher would have sat. So someday we'll have to switch that up and just remove all the chairs in here. Um, The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. He was about to teach. And this is what he says. Then he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing of it. He opens up the scroll and reads this portion about this thing that God is doing, that everything's going to be made right, that the Jubilee is coming, that there's going to be this kind of eternal goodness and eternal Jubilee. And he sits down and says, today, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. As you have heard it, it has been done. You might want to imagine if myself or Pastor Drew came up here and read some passage about Jesus' second return and said, today he has returned. You have heard it and it has happened. I mean, it'd be like heresy, right? Like you would drive us out of the church. That's what Jesus does here. He says, this has been done. It has been fulfilled. We actually see that in Jesus's preaching, this is a recurring theme. In fact, probably is the central point of Jesus's teaching is that the kingdom of God has come. He says the kingdom is at hand, which means it's within reach. Jesus came to heal and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, to die on our behalf and to be resurrected, to welcome us into the kingdom. And he's saying, this is fulfilled. This this vision, this prophecy of a kingdom where all nations, all tongues, all tribes will be invited to join the King, the Messiah is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. We see that we think, amen and amen. We believe this is true. They did not quite have the same response all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that come from his mouth. So at first they're like, wow, this guy's really well spoken, man. This is amazing. And they asked this question is not this Joseph's son. And at first, maybe this is a question of truly amazement. Maybe they're like, wow, this is the carpenter's son. And Jesus at this time, uh, before he began his public ministry was a carpenter. He was a blue collar worker, worked with his hands. He built things, uh, probably a uh, carpenter. We don't know if it exactly meant wood or stone or exactly what it meant, but essentially we might think of it as like a contractor, somebody who builds houses and barns and sheds and these kinds of things. This is what he did. <clears throat> and here he is invited to speak and he speaks eloquently. He speaks amazing words. And maybe at first this question is, wow, this is Joseph's son. He's normal. He's like us. And look at him speak. Look at how well spoken he is. But soon, as we heard in the rest of this passage, that question takes on a little bit of a different tone. Because as Jesus continues to challenge them, which we'll get to here in a moment, they begin to ask the question, maybe not so much, is this uh, Joseph's son? Maybe it's, is this Joseph's son? This is a small town in the ancient world. They would have probably heard about the mysterious nature of Jesus's conception, that he was conceived before Mary and Joseph were married, that there were questions whether or not Jesus was actually Joseph's son. And you might hear the question, is this not Joseph's son? We don't know. 
as Jesus began to challenge them, suddenly this idea of where he came from turned into something that they could use against him. Turns into something that they use to separate him from them. And they eventually drive him out of the synagogue and try to throw him off a cliff to kill him. This was part of the stoning process. If you had a cliff, you would actually throw them off the cliff and then you would throw stones down on them. So they got so mad at him because of his challenge, because of this question of, of where he came from and how could he talk to us like this? They got so mad that they wanted to commit murder. You see in this moment, Jesus's heritage was used against him. And he actually turns the question back on them by referencing a couple of, um, a couple of stories from the old Testament. We'll drop down here. Uh, as he talks about this, he's, he's going to reference first and second Kings, a guy by the name of Elijah and Elisha. And this is what he says. The truth is there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, this ancient prophet, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. So during this time in ancient Israel's history, there was a famine for three and a half years and there was no grain and no water, no oil. Cause there were no olives. There was nothing. And, and Elijah gets told by God to go visit this widow in Sidon. And this widow is a Gentile. This widow is not a follower of Yahweh. This widow is not part of the covenant community, the family of God. Yet God sends Elijah there and it, there's a miracle that's performed there. Elijah knocks on the door. He says, ma'am, can I stay with you? And uh, the widow says, sir, I have no, I have no grain. I have no oil. I can't make bread. I can't serve you. I can't be hospitable to you because I can't feed you. And he said, let me in and there will be enough. And as she begins to pour out the oil into a container, the container fills up and then another container fills up and she has this endless supply of oil as she keeps pouring and filling up jars and jars and jars. Same thing is true with the grain that she has as she pours it into a new container. It fills up container after container after container. And she has jars and jars and jars of grain where there was a famine in Israel. The Lord sent Elijah to this non Jewish person, this non Israelite, this Gentile, to bring about abundance. It's a lot like that image of the kingdom where all people are going to come and there's going to be no more hunger and no more thirst and no more violence and no more war. Elijah, God through Elijah created a little place of flourishing in the midst of a famine to a Gentile, to an outsider. You see, cause God knows something about us. He knows something about our hearts that we are really good and we are very quick to create a group of people that we feel comfortable with. And if you are not part of our group, you are not welcome that you are less than that. You do not have the right information that you are not living how you should. We're very quick to make an in group and an out group. And for Jesus, the question of his heritage came up is this Joseph's son? And sometimes we do this. Sometimes through our heritage, we kind of create the right way to do something. And then maybe there are all the other wrong ways to do something. Well, I don't really like how they go about, uh, you know, taking care of their home because they look different and they sound different. They listen to different music, wear different clothes. And so I'm, I don't really like that. And so I'm going to look down on them. We've created an in group. And if you are out, you are not good. You are not welcome. And Jesus continues with a very similar story where Elisha, the prophet who was a student of Elijah, uh, did something very similar. There was also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. Naaman was a Gentile a non-Israelite, somebody outside of God's family. And on top of that, he had 
because the Syrians at this time had been raiding Israel. They'd been raiding the villages and Naaman had raided and plundered villages in Israel. And he had kidnapped Israelite children to be his slaves. And it was actually a little slave girl that served Naaman that told him about Elisha to go get healed. So Naaman had leprosy and after trying everything, he listened to his slave girl, this Israelite who told him there's a man of God in Israel who can heal you. And he goes to Elisha and he's healed. Here again, we see our Lord giving us hints at his plan that those even who are outside of the family of God are invited in, are invited to be healed and invited to become part of the family but we are very quick through our sometimes nationality and sometimes even pride in our nationality or our heritage or our politics or even our religious tradition, our Christian tradition that we might have to have an in group and an out group. And as we've mentioned several times, um, idolatry as Richard Foster says is taking a good thing and making it an ultimate thing. So it's a good thing for us to have families that we're a part of and even wider families to be a part of and nations to be a part of and groups to be a part of, but we can make those things ultimate. We begin to draw the meaning of our life, not from Jesus, but from our group. So suddenly the meaning of our life is no longer to uh, uh, follow Jesus and to invite others to be close to him, but instead is to have all the right ideas about the particulars of our political system. And we also not only can find meaning, but we can find purpose. And our purpose might be to make sure the other side of the political spectrum loses as much as they can because they're wrong and we're right. It also creates in us pride that we know that we're right. We know that we have all the answers and everybody else is wrong. And we do this in our politics, in our nationality, in our heritage, and even in our Christian traditions. I can't tell you uh, uh, how many times I've experienced this. I grew up in the Methodist world. I was actually ordained as a Methodist pastor before uh, becoming Lutheran. And I have heard, I can't tell you how many times I've heard about how real Lutherans do things as I've passed through this church. I've been told, well, real Lutherans don't do X, Y, and Z that you did during service, right? It's taken an identity, it's taken a group that you're a part of, and it's finding pride and meaning and purpose in that thing. And then it's using that thing as a weapon against the other person. It's having an in-group. We're right and they're wrong. We're good and they're bad. And here in this passage that Jesus references is a different way of thinking about it about inviting people to become part of the kingdom, inviting and drawing all people into the goodness of God to find our meaning and our purpose and our pride, not in our groups that we're a part of, but instead in Jesus. And this is actually not only a really important part of Isaiah, but also of Paul as he reflects on Jesus and the work of Jesus later um, after he was converted to Christianity. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter two. He's writing Ephesians is a group of both Gentiles and Jews, uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And he's speaking specifically to the Gentile Christians uh, right now. But he says, remember that you were at one time without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he is our peace in his flesh. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. You see, Jesus invites us to this new way of life where we don't have a in group and an out group, but instead we are constantly inviting people to come closer and closer to Jesus, to become more and more part of the family of God, to continue to fulfill what Jesus has begun and what he continued to work to work through us, which is inviting all nations and all tribes and all tongues and all political affiliations, all heritages to be part of the kingdom of God instead of separating and pushing 
It's invitation and drawing close, proclaiming the good news to the poor and also those who are poor in spirit, those who are lonely and afraid about giving sight to the blind and not only by physically healing, but also by proclaiming the good news of Jesus to people who don't know Jesus, who haven't heard the good news by inviting people into the family so they may have healing and hope and goodness. This is what we are invited to be a part of, to proclaim the good news that God is bringing us all into his kingdom. And we get meaning. Our meaning is not in our affiliation with a particular heritage or political party or nationality, but our meaning is that we are a child of God. And those who are in Christ are also children of God, no matter all those other groups that they're a part of. We find purpose in continuing to proclaim this good news. And instead of pride, we have humility. We have humility to use these good gifts that God has given us to use the gifts that we have being part of this nation, being part of this heritage and this tradition and these things to use that for the good of others instead of weaponizing it against them. Because in us hearing about this good news to the poor, the sight to the blind, the the kingdom is at hand. It is fulfilled because Jesus has fulfilled it. And in Jesus, we are not separate, but we are together. And we are brought more and more into his goodness. This is the good news uh, that Jesus Christ has given us.